<laughs> Hi. Hi, is it your birthday? <laughs> today, today is my birthday, All truly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what better way to spend it exactly. than right here at the 92nd Street Y. That's, right, exactly. that's what I think. So I, you told me backstage you were my grand, your grandchildren Matt, are angry at me. Yes, they are. OK, yeah. because you left a party. I did. Yeah. I did. They put on a little party for me. It yeah. was yeah, exactly. It was so sweet. <laughs> and um, uh, sort of made a cake. Actually, the, they decorated the cake. Uh, and we played uh, a game or two. And then I said, well, I have to go. Why? Why, Grandma? Where are you going? I said, I have to go talk to Kara Swisher. That's why. <laughs> So I'm I'm happy to be here. Good. And, uh, All right, we have a lot. Yeah. To, we've got we've got a lot to get through, um, and a lot to talk about. Uh, you. Hillary and I met yesterday to talk a little bit about what's going on today, and there's a lot in the there's news. There's so much happening. So much happening. I mean, really. Um, we're gonna have we're gonna go from topic to topic to topic. Oh. Questions from the. Are you gonna, Are you okay? Yeah, right, I'm getting ready. So this is. This is the third interview we've done. We did one before, way before the election. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, we did one right after the election. Right, spring and, of 2017. Right, right mm -hmm. after, and then now. Exactly. So third time's a charm. Yes. Um, and I, what I was saying to Hillary backstage is um, every time Mark Zuckerberg talks to me, it ends in disaster and tears for Mark Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. I'm not hiding anybody's data, so I'm, right, I'm in exactly. good shape. Right, We're going to. <laughs> So um, I'm going to start with the, the news of today, Yeah. the, the bomber. So today, uh, this guy, Cesar, and I, I don't care what his name is, um, is uh, had this on his car. Right. Uh, with you with a target right. on it. Other people, lots of people with a target. Mm -hmm. And then uh, part of the thing said, this message was approved by Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, I know. Oh, yeah, you're right. What a surprise. Um, so uh, let's talk about that about what's going on, how you feel about this. Now, you got a pipe bomb uh, yes. delivered to you at your home. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Mm -hmm. Well, first, um, I, I want to just express my total gratitude uh, to the Secret Service, the FBI, law enforcement, <laughs> across the country. Um, you know, the fact that this man has been apprehended and there is apparently a very credible, strong case against him uh, speaks volumes about how uh, professional and focused um, our law enforcement uh, happens to be. And of course, when there's a bomb involved, uh, you have to have uh, an extraordinary level of calmness and uh, just focus to be able to deal with that, and I am uh, incredibly impressed uh, and appreciative as someone who, as you say, was a target of this kind of um, uh, alleged purported attack. Look, I think we're living at a time when the atmosphere is so volatile, filled with vitriol. Uh, we have a president who engages in reckless uh, rhetoric all the time mm -hmm. uh, that aims at demeaning, demonizing all kinds of people. He whips up the crowds that come to see him, and it's a, almost a, an addiction relationship, you know, that we've got you know, him up there just urging them on, they chanting and you know, giving back what he needs, I guess, to uh, make himself uh, feel you know, strong and important. And it's tragic, but it's also really dangerous. So and I'm, we've I'm, that is an example of the danger because, you know, look, this man, if he is the person which appears to be, he is responsible for his actions. But we do know enough about demagogues in history to know that when you engage in that kind of action and rhetoric, as we're seeing from the highest office of our country, aided and abetted by a huge echo chamber. Uh, there are people, this guy has a criminal record, uh, there are unbalanced people. You know, look, I remember when the, you know, the young man in North Carolina got in his car to drive to Washington, D.C. with his AR-15 to liberate uh, the children allegedly held in the basement of the pizza parlor. That, that you ran. Oh, that I ran, of course, yes. And, um, <laughs> 
You know what? You know, there was no basement can I just and say, no children. Can I, can um, can but I, he did shoot up the place. But there's excellent pizza there. Uh, there is. It's a great place if you're ever in Washington. So, so when you, you use the word demagogue, mm -hmm. Trump to you is a demagogue. Absolutely. And when he is doing this, like today, the reaction, how did, he, how did you react to his reaction to... to Look, he, he's just, I mean, to me, he just goes through the motions. I mean, at moments like that, when you really need a president, a president who unites the country, uh, somebody on his staff sticks a paper in front of him or words on a teleprompter, which he's then told to go out and recite. Um, he does it in a begrudging, not very convincing way. Um, and then he just waits for the chance when he can get into one of his rallies again or have any kind of audience that he can unleash himself. Um, you know, Madeleine Albright wrote a book um, earlier this year called Fascism, A Warning. And I really recommend it because I'm not only a huge admirer and friend of hers, but her perspective as someone who had to flee uh, Czechoslovakia twice, first from the Nazis, then from the communists, uh, is something Americans need to be reminded of. And she has a quote in there where Mussolini, a demagogue, an authoritarian, who used that kind of rhetoric, who inflamed the passions of thugs on the street, who beat up, intimidated, and eventually murdered political opponents, members of the press and the like. Mussolini says, you know, when you pluck a chicken feather by feather, nobody notices. Well. I think we now notice. I mean, how can we not notice? Well, except that day by day, it's a different thing. Last, you know, last month was this, then there was that. There has been about six things in a row. So when you're talking about that, wh where, does it, where do you think it's going to lead? It depends upon what happens in this election. I have never been surer in my life that an election is consequential for literally the future of our country. You know, look, if, if, if I had lost to a kind of a normal Republican. Um, <laughs> I, like who? Like who? Yeah. It's a normal Republican. Yeah, well, I'm, I, I'm not naming any of them. They'll be, you know, they'll, <laughs> they, they, they would be too, you know, nervous about that. But, um, you know, but, but somebody with whom I disagreed with on everything, like I have in the past, I wouldn't be happy. But I do remember after 9-11, and those of us in New York have special reason to remember, George W. Bush went to an Islamic center, and he spoke to the people there, and he spoke to the people of our country, saying, you know, this is about terrorism and terrorists. It's not about, you know, law-abiding people who we live with in our neighborhoods and our communities. Can you imagine that happening today? I, I can't, because we've seen no evidence that it could. Or if it did, again, it would be begrudging, unconvincing, and then out the door and back into the crazy stuff that we hear all the time. So look, this election now 10 days away um, will determine whether we actually have workable checks and balances to hold this administration accountable. In the absence of that, winning the House, maybe winning the Senate, um, I really do fear as to what will be next, what kinds of behavior so and you, action we might see so from him. So do you fear? Because you are the... Their I favorite. fear for the country, They're, yeah. What about yourself? No. Because you, you are their favorite person to talk about, well, locking you up, hurting you, right. bombing. Yes, well, you know... Why do, I'm sorry, that, is that not frightening to you? No, no. And I'll tell you, I mean... <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. First of all, you, you know, you, you, you cannot, if, if you at all are able, live in fear. You just can't. I mean, there's so much else that is great about my life, you know, including my grandchildren and everything else that goes with it. So I saw what they said about me. I saw the T-shirts they were selling. I saw the mugs they were selling. I saw the bumper sticks they were selling at their convention. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen anything like that. I mean, it really did go far beyond the bounds of political disagreement. A lot of it was just plain, old-fashioned sexism and misogyny. And I realized that I, you know, um, was vying to become president, which apparently was quite threatening to certain kinds of people. And so they were, you know, doing everything they could to diminish and demean me, um, you know. <laughs> 
Margaret Atwood, who wrote Handmaid's Tale, said, oh my gosh, it was medieval, wasn't it, what they did to you? And yeah, they tried. But I would never give them the satisfaction of thinking that they had ever gotten to me, even if they did get to me, which they have not. So that's not, that's not going to happen. Now, however, when you do get a pipe bomb sent to your address, you do worry about all the other people. I mean, people who open your mail, people who deliver it, people who might be in the vicinity. So, of course, I worry um, about what we can do to keep everybody uh, safe. Uh, but circling back to where we are right now, you've got a concerted, consistent attack on our democracy. You've got someone who is degrading the rule of law. Uh, you know, the very bureau, the, the FBI, that ran the investigation to find this guy has been uh, insulted and attacked by this president. You have the delegitimizing of elections, every effort being made to suppress and purge voters, to not count votes, to try to uh, rig the system, as it is sometimes alleged. Um, but clearly, it's happening in places like Georgia as we speak, where if there were a free, fair, transparent election, I am confident Stacey Abrams would be the next governor of the state of Georgia. So, 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 so what, when you're in this situation, what do you imagine is going to happen next if, if this election right. doesn't go that way? What do you well, think first of all, I'm doing everything I can. I hope all of you are too, to make sure it does go the right way. We've got, we've got the most amazing candidates, lots of women, lots of people of color, lots of young people. I mean, it would just be such a great uh, uh, sea change. Look, if we're not able to rein him in, I think there will be wholesale filing, firings, uh, particularly in the Justice Department, perhaps including uh, Robert Mueller. Uh, there will be increasing corruption, because remember, uh, the level of corruption is something we haven't seen since probably the 1920s and the Teapot Dome scandal. Um, and so many of the decisions that are being made look to be connected to what's in the financial interests of the president's family, corporation, and corporate allies. Um, we've got the likelihood that as bad as voter suppression has been, and it is, that it could be even worse. Uh, we know that his uh, views about every issue is resulting in the wholesale uh, elimination and reversing of regulations. I mean, until he became president, I thought the issue about the dangers of asbestos had been settled. Um, <laughs> So there's so much more damage, right. some of it very obvious, very clear, makes the headlines, and a lot of it just slowly eroding uh, the function and services uh, of government. How much do you feel at fault for this? Do you feel at all in terms of, do you think about that? I know. Sure, no, no, look, I, yeah, if I'd won, none of this would be happening. Yeah, okay. uh, so yeah, I do, I do think about it. Um, I, do you think you know, about that at all? Like the, of course I do, yeah. and and I wrote a whole book about it, um, yeah, which I read it. Uh, I read it. which now you know is out in paperback for anybody who hasn't read it yet. Um, <laughs> but you know, but in it I talk about look, we made we made mistakes. I made mistakes. I don't know any campaign or any human being who doesn't. So that kind of is baked into it. Um, but there were some very unusual, unprecedented. Uh, activities that were going on in that campaign and obviously you and I have talked before right, get into that. about you know the Russians right, and what they did and what the impact of it uh, was uh, I believe uh, likely to have been with respect to the outcome so there were things happening that had never happened before and that was then now nearly two years ago and from everything we know, a lot of it is still happening because there's no incentive for this administration to really do what should be done to keep foreign adversaries, not just the Russians, but you know, if you're sitting in Tehran or in Beijing or in Pyongyang and you say, hey, the Russians did this, hey, let's, let us give it a try, you're going to have even more foreign interference, influence peddling, propaganda, 
going on and there's no concerted effort to try to so, well, stop that. When we talked right after the election, mm -hmm. you were raising these issues I around was. the Russians. I was. And most people, the minute we got off stage, it was Breitbart, Fox News, mm -hmm. all the others saying you were crazy. That yeah, the they said that before. Yeah, I, I, they keep, they, <laughs> they, you yeah. may not listen to it, but they're still saying it. Um, they, uh, they, you talked about this and mm -hmm. in detail. What have you learned since of what you think happened there? And then let's get into yeah. social media's right. uh, well, relationship. Right, um, well, you know, after the election, I did not know what happened, um, but I was determined that I would try to find out to the best of my ability, given, you know, fast moving events and unveiling uh, of information. And look, I, I really believe that there was a combination of factors that changed the outcome at the very end. Um, starting on October 7th, uh, the uh, day was so consequential. It started with the first public uh, admission by our intelligence agencies in the Obama administration that the Russians had been hacking, okay. And it was also a warning that we don't know what else they're doing, we're trying to figure this out. That was in the morning. A few hours later, the Hollywood access tapes uh, came out. A few hours after that, WikiLeaks dumps John Podesta's emails. Now, I don't believe in coincidences. Um, and why were those dumped? They were being held to be dumped in order to divert attention from anything that might derail Trump. You know, in the first Mueller indictment, uh, which I, you know, some of you may be uh, interested in reading both indictments so far, the first one on social media basically has a line in it where it's an intercepted conversation or email where the Russian general is directing uh, his intelligence agents, you know, do everything negative you can to Hillary Clinton but not to Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, we support them. So this is, this is something that had been churning and going on uh, for many months. And we know about the DNC emails and now all of a sudden the Podesta emails. And what was fascinating about it is the way that they were weaponized. You know, this pizza, uh, so-called Pizzagate thing, uh, came from a, the, a totally innocent email that the, you know, the right, uh, aided and abetted by the Russians, whipped up into this ridiculous, terrible um, conspiracy uh, accusation. So we now know a lot more than we did when I started writing my book. But when I was writing my book, I had enough evidence, the Russians, the suppression of votes, which was particularly uh, obvious in a state like Wisconsin, uh, sexism, uh, misogyny, uh, there, there was enough evidence to be able to make the assertions that I made in the book because when I came to talk with you in the spring of 2017, I hadn't finished the book, right. but I felt confident enough in the face of the disbelief and the you know, dismissal of what I was saying. Well, I didn't know about the Trump Tower meeting. You know? I didn't know about the you know, many uh, meetings and connections between uh, people close to Trump and his campaign and Russians, Russian agents, Russian proxies. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a new book out, which seems to be the best uh, analysis of this by Kathleen Hall Jameson, who's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, who's an expert in elections, and she has studied everything. And, and here's her conclusion. This is not mine. Here's her conclusion. The manipulation of social media certainly changed people's minds. I mean, you would not invest money and effort, a huge intelligence operation coming from uh, Russia, the role that Cambridge Analytica played, all the rest of that, unless you were hoping to change some minds on the margins, a couple thousand here, a couple thousand there. And then the hacking and then the use of the uh, WikiLeaks obviously um, was another big factor, which she actually thinks was even more consequential. And then, of course, October 28th, you know, we got this uh, uh, you know, surprise uh, from Jim Comey. Uh, which devastated me, and then a few days later, he, on a Sunday afternoon, does a little, you know, two-line email, just kidding, basically, nothing there, right. which didn't do me much good. Um, so uh, this all happened. So when I talk about what happened, I'm not just looking backwards. I'm trying to say the Russians are still in our electoral system. We know that media and other 
uh, sources of information are being manipulated. We understand that. Let's do something about it because we so, can't so afford this. Before we do, so yeah. one of the things you talk about is social media. You're not on right. Facebook that much, I guess. No, not too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Talk to me about that. The idea of what they've done. They, you know, Chanel yeah. Samber was a big supporter of you. Yeah. The, a lot of Silicon Valley was. Um, not as much as Barack Obama. It was interesting. Um, how do you look at those? What, what is their culpability in this, from your point of view? Well, I mean, you're really the expert on this, Kara, and, and the stuff that you write and the the lines you connect is, is uh, really uh, in, informative to me. I, I think that what happened is a very uh, clever um, adversary, political adversary in the case of Cambridge Analytical and others, but literally a national adversary, national security adversary in the case of Russia, just exploited the heck out of Facebook. Right. And used it for the way it was built. Used, used it both um, as it was built, but also manipulated it. And the, you know, the the purchase of uh, information, the purchase of, of posts, the purchase of ads, the purchase of whatever that was going on, paid Box. for with rubles. Right. Um, in uh, yeah, exactly. In the first uh, instance, uh, there was a very well organized effort on Facebook. Uh, to go far beyond the usual methodology right. that we'd seen, you know, first off in the Obama campaign. And, you know, I had the same people working for me, basically, mm -hmm. and they were going kind of Obama 2.0, and we were working really hard in this arena about how you identify voters and give them information, answer their questions, persuade them. What was happening in the campaign, though, and, you know, this was a combination of all the efforts going on, is that you know, Trump and, and his team were playing a whole different game. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, after the election and questions started being asked uh, that Facebook or Twitter or anybody else began to try to delve a little more deeply into what their platform had been used for. Uh, and so what, do you, what do you think of those companies then? Look, I, I think... I think we are in a, uh, a very, uh, we're, not, we're certainly in a new uncharted territory. Uh, I, I think that the companies themselves are going to have to be held accountable. I am so. a, I'm a supporter of the efforts, you know, uh, Congressman Ro Kahana, Professor Berners-Lee, others who are trying to come up with some kind of uh, regulatory platform uh, that would give uh, uh, support to uh, the continuing open platform that we want there to be so people can communicate, but with more accountability imposed upon the companies so that they would have to recognize that what's happening now is far beyond anything Mark Zuckerberg thought about in his dorm in Harvard. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have the military in Myanmar using Facebook to stoke genocide against the Rohingya, that is not something that is going to bring people together and create community. Just the opposite. Mm -hmm. It is being used for the worst kinds of political purposes. And now, you know, Facebook just admitted Iran has, you know, taken a page from the Russian book and they're in there trying to figure out, okay, how do we sow discord? How do we create divisiveness within uh, America? I mean, what I want people to understand is, yeah, it might have been most uh, apparent to us for the first time uh, in the 2016 election, but our adversaries play a long game. Mm -hmm. And part of their long game, and this is part of Putin's whole world view, is to cause as much divisiveness within the United States, pitting groups against each other, uh, creating, uh, as they did during the campaign, uh, phony demonstrations, and really uh, aggressively uh, negative um, advertising. advertising in order for people to kind of get off balance and you to to walk the, away from you, our democracy. Have you seen Mark or Cheryl since the election? Um, I have. Uh, Say thanks a lot. I appreciate it. No. I mean, <laughs> look, I, I, I think they, they knew more during the election than they admitted, but I think they didn't understand the full 
implication of it. And what about the Obama administration? Uh, well, I think that you know they were in a terrible bind. You know, when uh, when it became clear that the Russians not only had hacked materials, emails from the DNC, but now we know from the second indictment by Mueller, stolen a lot of our uh, our voter data. You know, which is sort of the lifeblood. And so you always wonder, well, how did the Trump campaign or one of their outside groups know? to target you know, Joe Smith and Eau Claire, Wisconsin uh, with this message. Well, they stole the data we had acquired, both our campaign and the Democratic National Committee, that gave us our persuadable targets, you know, people who could go either way. Um, so when all of this was being discovered, I think uh, starting in August of 2016, the intelligence uh, uh, officials within the Obama administration went to see what's called the Gang of Eight. The Gang of Eight are the four, you know, leaders in the House, four leaders in the Senate, the, you know, the majority minority leader and the and the chair and ranking member of the intelligence committees. That's what's called the Gang of Eight. And they went to brief them. And as I understand what happened, uh, they basically said, "We're very concerned about this, and the president's going to confront Putin, and Brennan's going to." you know, deliver this message to the, you know, Russian national security uh, director, et cetera. Um, and, and we want to warn the American public because this is like a threat to our election. And Mitch McConnell said, if you do, I'll say it's partisan and I will um, go after you for it. That's basically what happened. So that put, that put the, the Obama White House in a really difficult position. Now, they also thought I was going to win. I mean, all of their polling, all of their analytics, plus ours, everybody said I was going to win. So I think so that their, their thinking on this, which I really, you know, I'm, I, I, I can't help but understand how difficult the problem was, uh, was what do we do? I mean, you know, McConnell does this, which he's fully capable of doing, as we have seen, uh, since, you know, no, you know, no line uh, can not be crossed in order to undercut our our democratic norms and uh, the regular order of the Senate. So I think they just decided that they couldn't do it. Now there was some there was some effort to try to get out to the rest of the world. Harry Reid wrote a letter to Jim Comey saying, "If you know things about what's happening in the election, you owe it to the American people uh, to tell them." But it, it you know the trade-off they they faced was uh, a difficult one. I wish they could have figured out some way to try so, to you know so because we were we were trying to get as much information as possible and we didn't know what they knew. That was right. not within our so, purview. So are you worried? I want to get to the 2020 yeah. election, some other issues. Uh, are you yourself worried about these elections now with the continued? Well, I'm worried because even the intelligence. Uh, officials in the Trump administration are worried. I mean, they, they went, you know, you had the director of national intelligence and homeland security and, you know, the, the CIA, everybody came to the White House briefing room a couple of months ago and basically said the Russians are still in our systems. Now, they were trying to talk to the guy who lives at the White House. Um, and, and they did it by hoping that, you know, what they said would be on Fox and Friends so that he would actually, you know, see it and <laughs> maybe, you know, think about the country. Um, so if they're worried about it, and Dan Coates, who's a, a, a very, uh, national you know, he's, he's, a, he's, a, yeah, he's a Democrat, he's the director of national intelligence. He's a very thoughtful, oh. smart guy. He basically said, yeah, the light is blinking red. Now, I don't know how much more specific you could be. So the Russians are in. How far are they in? What are they prepared to do? For whom, since Trump is not on the ballot? Well, we know they got into voter registration databases. There are, you know, there are so many concerns about already existing voter suppression and uh, purging that's going on in, in many states. Uh, but Georgia seems to be the so, prime example. So say it doesn't work. And, they, and that we have an election and, and the Democrats win the House. Mm -hmm. Are you in favor of an impe impeachment proceeding? <coughs> you know, I, th I think that um, if there is evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors, well, then that's the responsibility of the House. But I don't think that they can uh, assume that until the Mueller investigation is done. That seems to me to be the appropriate uh, process. But there's a lot that has to be done anyway. 
every single committee has to do investigations and hold hearings about what is being done in the uh, agencies as they attempt to turn the clock back. And it's not just turn the clock back on the Obama eight years, it's literally turn the clock back a half a century. You know, really trying to just rip the guts out of uh, the civil rights enforcement and all kinds of other important matters like the environment, climate change, whatever we know is important, they have it under their so, thumb right now. So a house under a democratic leadership, I think, will have to come with a positive agenda. We need to reinstate the Voting Rights Act. We need to do a whole lot of other things, deal with campaign finance reform and the like, and begin to do a lot of investigations. And they've got, they've got to get off the dime quickly so that they can start reporting to the American people about it. And the fi final thing on this whole area is, you know, when Mitch McConnell said the other day that they were likely going to look to Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid because the deficit and the debt have exploded because of their very, uh, I believe, irresponsible tax cut, you know, you've got you've to do both offense and defense. And people need to know before they vote on November 6th that the Republicans will come right after your Social Security and your Medicare and your Medicaid. I saw that after Bush won his second term. As soon as he won, they began going after Social right, Security, so Medicare, and Medicaid, and we had to, you know, really stop them from being successful. So you seem rather passionate. I am really, I really. <laughs> well, yes, I am. So, do you, we're gonna talk about 2020 in a minute. Do you wanna run again? No. Wait. <laughs> No. That was a pause. Well, I, well, I'd like to be president. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, be, look, I, I, I think, hopefully, when we have a Democrat in the Oval Office in January of 2021, there's going to be so much work to be done. I mean, we have confused everybody in the world, including ourselves. And <laughs> we have confused our friends and our enemies. Right. They have no idea what the United States stands for, what we're likely to do, what we think is important. Uh, so the work would be work that I feel very well prepared for, having been in the Senate for eight years, having been a diplomat uh, in the State Department. And it's just going to be a lot of heavy lifting. So um, are you going to be yeah. doing any of that lifting? Do you feel like... Oh, I have no idea, Kara, but I'm, I'm going to... You know, I'm not going to even think about it until we get through this uh, November 6th election about what's going to happen after that, but I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure we have a Democrat in the White House come January of 2020. And who, and, and who among... We're going we're gonna to talk about your role in that in a second, but who among them are you interested in? Well, you know, I, I, I know everyone who's running and or thinking of running or possibly running. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's always that period between, hey, that sounds like a really good idea, and then trying to actually think it through, see if it is the right thing for you to do, see if you can raise the money, all of the questions that go into it. So I'm not going to handicap uh, the race before anybody actually gets into it. Uh, I, think there, I think we'd have a number of excellent candidates who would be uh, really formidable on the campaign trail, but let's wait and see who it is. I mean, we may have as many as 15, 20 candidates, and right. you know that, that's a big group to try to sort itself out, um, and I'm just gonna wait and, and uh, you know, watch you, it happen. Do you have anyone you're particularly <laughs> interested in? Um, no, I'm, I'm, you know, there, no, there, there, are a number of, there are a number of excellent potential candidates. <laughs> You know, look, this, first of all, if we don't win on November 6th. I'm going to start 6th, naming names and see what you're thinking. No, I, I, oh, okay, if you want to. But all if, right, I will. But if we okay, don't no, win, I'm going to. can I, okay. Okay. But, if, but if we don't okay. win on November 6th, honestly, I mean, I know this sounds far-fetched, but this administration, if they continue to control all branches of government and they have been stocking the courts with ideologues, um, you, will, you will find that it will be much more difficult to run. And people who have never had to face the fire, once they get out there and they start being the target of the vitriol and hatred that comes against anybody who criticizes Trump, 
you know, that, that's going to cause a number of people to do a bit of soul searching. Um, so I, I think we've got to give everybody who is thinking about it, or even people who wake up on November 7th and start thinking about it, uh, right. we've got to give them you know, the space to make what is a really serious calculation depending upon right, what the we, political situation is. Can we talk about individually? And then I want to get to Saudis and some, um, Warren. What? Warren, Elizabeth Warren. Oh, Elizabeth's a great, you know, she, look, she's running for re-election. She's obviously going to be re-elected uh, overwhelmingly and she's got a great message. She's got a great, uh, uh, you know, passion for uh, the uh, fight to restore the middle class. I mean, if she decides to run, she'll have a lot to say. Bloomberg. Well, you know, I think Mike Bloomberg becoming a Democrat should at least suggest he's thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Uh, I, I had the same thought. Yeah, I, I, I mean, great minds and all of that. I yeah. think he is, um, you know, he, is, he, he has overwhelming resources, but he also, you know, has a real uh, interest in running things and making them work better. And, you know, he'd have to get out there and persuade Democrats that he was actually in the primary to be the Democratic nominee. But if he, get, if he gets out there, I think he'll have, uh, you know, a lot to contribute. Uh, let's see, Kamala Harris. Kamala is a fantastic, uh, you know, human being as well as uh, a terrific senator. And she, uh, you know, she just brings a whole uh, very fresh and open uh, approach to a lot of these issues that she cares deeply about, that she's worked on as attorney general, as a prosecutor before that. And being from California is a big deal because the California primary will have by far the largest number of delegates. So, you know, the politics and, and her uh, obvious interests in these important issues would stand her in good stead. Okay. Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, look, she's an icon, and she, she, has, uh, she has said she's not interested, and really- yeah, I don't believe her. You I'm don't believe her? Well, then- I'm teasing, I believe her. You believe her. <laughs> you do believe her. Well, I, I believe her because, I mean, I mean, she's got almost the perfect life right now, you know? Right. Uh, <laughs> And she has, I'll tell you a story that is kind of related, although a little off topic. So when, um, when Aung San Suu Kyi, who I got to know quite well when I was leading the opening of the United States to actually go back into what was then called Burma, Myanmar, you know, she was the human rights icon, the, you know, the, the lady, the lady who had lived in a house arrest, who had stood up for democracy in her country. And she and I had a really uh, long couple of conversations about her decision that she was going to go into politics. And I said to her then, I said, you know, I can understand why you want to do that. You want to be part of helping to forge this democracy that you have fought for, suffered for, uh, over so many years, but once you go from icon to politician, it will be a very different world so that you true. will face. And the calculations, the thinking that you have to make as a politician uh, oftentimes, you know, pushes you to compromise, forces you to have to, uh, you know, ally yourself with people that you agree with one time out of a hundred. There's just a lot that goes into it. You know, it is the making of sausage. So, uh, so, so I think that Oprah is, is so smart. I think she would say, look, I can help influence the debate. I can be talking about important things that we need to, you know, be a, a country that starts talking and listening to each other again, rather than getting into the political arena. So she wouldn't want to like hang out with Sean Hannity, for example. <laughs> well, no Democrat likes to hang out with Sean Hannity. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's one of the problems. Yeah. You know, the, the propaganda value that Fox provides to the Republican Party is incalculable. It is so incredibly important to their brand, to their messaging. They, they just put, turn themselves over to be, you know, in uh, an al alliance with Fox. So uh, I think that it's difficult to go on their shows, very few Democrats any longer do, because you know, there's no such thing as, as having a reasonable conversation. You're just going to be, you know, you know, beaten up and chopped up and, and delivered to the audience. Would, you, would so. you go on Fox News? I've gone on Fox News. I've been on Fox News. And, you know, look, there are a few people that you feel like you could have a, a reasonable uh, conversation with. Uh, Sean Hannity is not one of them. Okay. But not, that would not be 
my recommendation to Oprah or anybody I, else. Right? I would agree. <laughs> I'm going to get off these things. I want to talk about you. I'm going to talk about personal things with you and also, but, but running. One of the things that has happened, let's start with the political part. There's been a lot of articles. Hillary should shut up. Mm. Hillary should not talk. Hillary's got to go away. Right. What? Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but those articles are there. You know them. Of course, yeah. What do you think of those? I think they're ridiculous. I got that. <laughs> so what, no. why, where do they come, where from your perspective they come from? Well, I don't know. Um, I, I, I noticed that there were no articles telling Al Gore to go away or John Kerry to go away or John McCain or Mitt Romney to go away. Mitt Romney is going to the Senate. That's where he's going. Um, and so I, I don't really know. I think we could speculate, but I, I don't have any, uh, you know, any evidence or no, information. please speculate. No, speculate, okay. <laughs> um, look, I, I, think, I, I think some of it, and I write about this in my book, some of it is just of the same category of the sexist behavior and sexist kind of talk around me and my campaign, but not only me. You mentioned a couple of my former, you know, colleagues from, you know, having been in the Senate. Elizabeth Warren's on the floor of the Senate delivering a speech against Jeff Sessions to be Attorney General, and she's reading from a letter by Coretta Scott King, who had doubts about Jeff Sessions years before when they wanted to make him a judge. And Mitch McConnell goes to the floor, and as the majority leader, he has certain prerogatives, and he basically orders her to stop talking because she is, uh, you know, attacking the character of a fellow senator. And and she, as that's where the phrase comes, you know, nevertheless she persisted. She kept talking, and he ordered her off the floor. I never saw that in eight years. Um, and what was especially interesting to me, because I was watching it in real time, is that she left the floor, and a Democratic senator, a good guy, comes and reads the rest of the letter, and McConnell never says anything. Or Kamala Harris questioning uh, in one of her hearings, as a former prosecutor, she's really you know, going after the witness. It uh, might have been Jeff Sessions again. Um, and the chairman basically told her to, you know, cease and desist, that she was being disrespectful. Now, excuse me, um, I, I have seen a lot of the back and forth in the Senate. People can get a little heated. And then look at what happened in the Kavanaugh hearings, right? I mean, the way that Kavanaugh spoke to and treated Amy Klobuchar was just outrageous. And also, similarly, to Dianne Feinstein. Um, now, so, so yes, I mean, I have my own experiences. I wrote about those, but I also said in my book, the press and the political press is still kind of dominated by uh, an attitude about politics that is very male-centric, very male-oriented. You know, I've given hundreds of speeches, and maybe thousands by this time, and the uh, I've, I've been on lots of platforms with a lot of male speakers, and male speakers get worked up, and they start to shout, and they may even pound the podium. Well, all of a sudden, I'm the one speaking too loudly. I'm the one who is being criticized by uh, the political press. So I think some of it is that really pervasive, persistent uh, double standard that exists, and uh, I regret that because it stands in the way of a lot of women uh, being taken seriously and going as far as they can. And you have to persevere through it. You can't give in to it. Uh, so when they say that, um, I, you know, I basically ignore it for obvious reasons. If you don't want to hear what I have to say, don't report on it. Don't talk to me. Don't come to this event. I mean, right. yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. there are a lot of ways to avoid it. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> let, let's move, though, to the personal. We talked to, Hillary and I met yesterday to talk yeah. about this issue. Right. The stuff you said about Monica Lewinsky, really disturbing to me mm -hmm. and a lot of women. Do you want to redo on that one? Well, look, I, I um, have talked about this before. Uh, this was a really painful, difficult uh, time in my life, and it was also hard for the country. Um, and I feel very sorry for what she went through and what she was subjected to uh, by uh, the star investigation and everyone who uh, mistreated her, mistreated her, uh, in my opinion, you know, just disgracefully. So yes, I'm very sorry about what happened to her. And I also know that um, you know, my decision to work through uh, what happened in my life uh, was 
uh, very, um, you know, debated by a lot of people who uh, whether you should stay or not. State. Well, yeah, that I mean that, and that, but that's a question for any person in any kind of relationship, marriage or otherwise, where uh, you confront uh, this kind of. Uh, uh, you know, real challenge to you. And look, through a lot of work and a lot of uh, counseling, um, I decided to uh, forgive uh, my husband, to continue with our marriage, our family. Um, and, I, and I understand how now 20 years later, a lot of decisions um, are being, uh, you know, reconsidered or looked at again from different points of view. I totally get that because I've spent my entire adult life, standing up for women, defending women, well, what, in court, in, you know, politics, everywhere that I can, uh, and I, you know, believe strongly that this moment is especially critical for women's voices about their experiences to be heard and be taken so seriously. I, I, wanna, I do want to get in your head is why say something like that when she's a young woman mm -hmm. in a position of not power? Well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to re rego relitigate everything I've ever said for 20 years. Right. I'm just going to say what I just said and say that I am very focused on doing everything I can to make women's voices uh, heard and respected. And I'm hoping that with all these amazing women running for office right now, we're going to have so many new women's voices. And if we get out and vote on November 6th, we're going to elect more women, more exciting women to go to Congress, to go to uh, state houses, to be in the debate. And that's really what's going to help change. And not just have newspaper articles about things that happen, but actually change attitudes, change laws, change people's has, behavior. Has your attitudes changed about? I've always been a staunch believer. Yes, you're, you're the woman who said. Women's rights are human rights, absolutely. No, I've, my attitude has been, um, my attitude has been consistent and it's always been consistent. Um, and I think that people have to take responsibility for themselves and their actions. Uh, but I also think that we need to make sure that no voice is stifled or ignored any longer. Do you see why people were upset by that? Well, people have been upset with me for reasons uh, that are All right, but going back, you know, I guess since yeah, my birth, is... it seems like. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I accept that. Yeah, I accept yeah. that people can be upset about uh, things that I say or things that I do, but I, I have been consistent. I will keep fighting for the same thing, and I will always keep fighting uh, for women's uh, rights and So what do you uh, make roles. of this Me Too moment? Well, I think it's long overdue. Uh, you know, look, when I was coming up, uh, in, you know, in college, law school. I mean, there were lots of really uncomfortable moments. I write a little bit about some of the harassment that I faced, although I never felt, uh, you know, I never felt like I was really uh, at risk or in danger. Uh, but I did write about, you know, meeting with a bunch of men in an election that I was part of in Indiana in 1976 and a guy not liking what I said and reaching over and grabbing my turtleneck and just, you know, really threatening me. And, you know, that was not very pleasant. So I know how hard it was for those of us who were in that, um, you know, that time to be taken seriously, not to be uh, dismissed or made fun of or laughed at, all the things that women uh, have had to contend with. Um, and we're now at a point, having gone through that, and a lot of us my age, you know, you just sort of sucked it up. You didn't, you know, you, you didn't complain, you didn't explain, you just sort of tried to get your best, you know, your best outcome. And I remember when I was taking the law student uh, test, uh, I was one of very few women in a big room at Harvard, and I had come with another woman from Wellesley College, and we were sitting there, and the men were just literally taunting us, harassing us, I guess trying to throw us off. So I'm, I'm really very grateful that we now have a movement, a moment where young women in particular are able to not only speak up, uh, but to defend themselves, to uh, be as, as brave as they can be, and that they're not alone can doing it. Can you imagine it. it's gonna last? Look what happened with Kavanaugh. Well, that's the danger, isn't it? I mean, I think, did you think there is a backlash. What did, did you think he would? Well, I, look, I've had, I've had, you know, I've had a lot of reasons to oppose him, and I laid those out in 
some Twitter threads about you know what he uh, what he has uh, advocated for and uh, decided as a judge. I think it was a, a very unfortunate choice, and the most consequential aspect of it may be, and this is the reason I think Trump wanted him there, is after being one of the main advocates for the most aggressive, outrageous uh, prosecutorial behavior in the late 90s, uh, he's now concluded conveniently that presidents uh, should be exempt from uh, any kind of investigation. So we'll see how all this plays out. But there, there is a backlash. You know, I, at the end of it, I, I really thought, you know, if you, if, you, if you compare Anita Hill with her dignity, her stoicism, uh, her integrity, when she appeared and tried to do her civic duty to provide testimony, uh, with Dr. Ford, who was you know, trying really hard to explain herself and to not go too far. She didn't want to overstate it, and she wanted people to understand it. You had two different kinds of approaches that women can take in presenting themselves, and they were both treated the same way. You know, the person that they were giving evidence against you know, basically came in and just took a, a really high pressured, very aggressive uh, tone of voice with all kinds of accusations. Uh, you know, with Clarence Thomas, it was the high, you know, tech lynching. And with, you know, with Kavanaugh, it was a conspiracy and everybody's against me. And so here are two women, both of whom professionals, had to already go through a lot to get to where they are in life. And the sheer force of that, you know, kind of primo male presence uh, was enough to uh, overlook what they were saying. Did you believe her? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah, I mean, why, why would you subject yourself to this? Yeah. I mean, she did not seek it out. She, she felt like she had a duty to provide that information and uh, she was very brave, I thought. All right, we're gonna get some questions from the audience. Okay. Should, we talked about this yesterday, should the U.S. end our relationship with Saudi Arabia? Well, we should certainly be uh, imposing some accountability on Saudi Arabia. Um, there's two we elements, met. well, there's two Obama elements to this. Salam, right? Yeah, look, I mean, the, you know, we've had a, a long, since literally FDR, long relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia. A lot of it focused on our need for their oil, which we don't need so much anymore, um, and then later sort of focused on you know, their role in the region and especially post-1979, their counterbalance to Iran. So there are reasons to have a, uh, a relationship uh, that is focused on our interests and our security, but it's very clear uh, that if we don't send a, a signal to the new, uh, the new ruler, the crown prince, uh, that he could very well continue down a path that would destabilize his own country and destabilize uh, the region uh, to their detriment and ours. And the premeditated murder of Khashoggi uh, was so cold-blooded, so barbaric, medieval, that it's hard to imagine they did. They never stopped to think maybe somebody would know we were doing this. Right. But if they did, they must have concluded we don't care, because the only country we really care about in terms of their reaction are not the Turks, who we already have some rivalries with, but the United States. And you know, we're not. Have, we don't have to worry about think the President Trump, Trump and, and Jared Kushner. Right. Do you think Jared Kushner signaled that to them, as some people? Well, we don't know all of the signaling that was done during the campaign, nor in the immediate aftermath of the election. We're learning more about secret meetings in the Seychelles and efforts to try to have secret back channels to Russia and visits from representatives of Arab nations. So we know there was a lot of activity uh, that I have to believe was meant to uh, you know, further the uh, interests of the Trump family, um, and including real estate interests in this city, 
uh, that were then uh, taken to the next level with Trump making his first visit there and on from that. There are, there are reports that Kushner may have shared uh, American intelligence or at least intelligence gathered by Americans, maybe from other sources, uh, with uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the uh, crown prince. I don't know that to be a fact, but the very idea that it's being talked about is deeply troubling. Is he incompetent or incompetent? Oh, I think they, I think <laughs> they always have a goal in mind. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, they, you know, they have a, a really weird idea about democracy. You know, Trump's um, open admiration of dictators, his desire to be able to order people around, to uh, go after his, quote, enemies, go after a free press, everything that he does on a daily basis, I think those views are shared by uh, his closest uh, advisors, and they're always looking for some advantage, and it could be an advantage for their own personal financial interests, it could be an advantage for uh, how they uh, see dominance and power, but it doesn't, as often as it should, which is all the time, uh, correspond with our national security interests. Do you wish you had turned around at that debate and said, back off, jackass? <laughs> Well, that was a physical evidence of it. Yes, you know, uh, I did think about it. I, um, <laughs> what stopped I, you? You know, I, I, I will tell you, it, it's something I've talked a lot about with my uh, women friends who are in politics or used to be in politics. Mm -hmm. And boy, we've had some great conversations about it because, I mean, the dilemma, and hopefully the more women we elect, the more women we up, uh, have up on the stage, the more it won't be just one woman carrying all the water. You'll have a lot of different women, like men in politics, who are come in all sizes and shapes and you know, ideological uh, perspectives. So uh, we talk a lot about it, and their, their common conclusion is, wow, that would have been really hard to do without looking either weak or angry. And I certainly didn't want to look weak since he was playing, you know, the alpha male. Uh, and that was something that I know goes through the minds uh, of voters, particularly Republican voters, uh, particularly male voters. Like, is this person strong enough to be, you know, commander in chief of the military and all of that? But also being angry. Uh, that's why I'm so glad there's these books being written by, you know, Rebecca Traister and others who are talking about legitimizing women's anger because. Right now, it is still seen as an aberration or as threatening. So, so um, I'm just curious, what yeah. would you have said? I could stand behind me if you want. No, you know, <laughs> I would have said something like, you know, back off. You're not going to intimidate me. Oh. And we're supposed to be here talking about the issues that matter to the American people. So quit your game playing and answer the question, something oh. like that. Okay. Okay. okay, that's a good one. So that sort of answers this question, what would you say to men? <laughs> what, what do you wish we knew? Back off. <laughs> Stop your game playing. You know, Stop I do the sexual I, I harassment. Think there is a lot. I mean, I'm actually really glad that you asked the question okay. and that Kara chose it because there's a lot of confusion. You know, I, I have two brothers. I had a dad who was a chief petty officer in the Navy during World War II. You know, I have lots of male friends. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm married to a man. I'm, yeah. You know, so I, I... I hear the generals really like you. Yeah, the ge I got a lot of generals I like. So, okay. um, I, I, look, I think we've got to get back to basics. What do women want? The age-old question Freud asked. We want to be respected. We want to be treated with equality. We want our chances in life not to be... Uh, decided by the fact that we are women. Uh, I remember I was doing a, uh, I was doing a, uh, a Voice of America <clears throat> call-in question when I was first lady. And the question came from a man who said he was in Iran, which I thought was interesting. And it was after my Beijing speech about women's rights or human rights. And he said to me on, the, on this broadcast, he said, I just don't understand what that means. What, what is it? What does it mean to have a woman's rights? What does that mean? I said, so I want you to shut your eyes and imagine everything you can do. You can walk down the street without being afraid. You can go to a soccer game and cheer your lungs out if you want to. You can go to work. You can have a family that you are proud of and, and a part of. Whatever you could do, 
I want you to think that a woman should be able to do exactly the same thing that you can do. That's what we're asking for. We're not asking you know, to be better than or given extra special uh, privileges, but we want to be treated uh, as you're equal. Yeah. And, and everything that we can bring to the table be respected. So yeah. I think- I, I want extra special privileges, but go Yeah, ahead. but well, <laughs> there are outliers that we have to deal with. Um, <laughs> You know, if you know Kara, you know she's not kidding. Um, I'm not. So, but 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 Special no, this is a thing. conversation that needs to take place in in homes and businesses, because I do think, it, for most of us, and 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 I, I guess for nearly all men, you know, that's just not what you were raised to believe. You were yeah. raised to be the protector, the supporter, the you know, the patriarch, whatever it might have been, whatever the particular. Uh, category was. And so, yes, this is a huge cultural shift. And so I, I, I take it seriously, and it's going to take a while to work through um, our families and our workplaces, our societies. Yeah, it's hard. I have two sons, and they tried to drive me off the sidewalk the other day, because they own the sidewalk, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and you found yourself on the edge, right? Right, yeah. and then I shoved the crap out of them. <laughs> As you know, my theory that all men should be raised by lesbians and then moved back to the general population. Um, such good men. And they're really good at sports then. Okay, um, so are the Democrats becoming the victim of too much political correctness? Just a few more, I know you have to Okay, no, look, I think, um, I think this is a much tougher question than it sounds because yeah. the easy answer is, well, you know, we don't want political correctness. We just want people to, you know, express themselves and, and be honest and authentic uh, in what they say and believe. But I think it's also the case that what's often called political correctness is politeness. Right. Um, it, it's, it's not being rude and, and insulting to people. Um, it's respecting the diversity that we have in our society. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly how to answer that because you know, the Democratic Party is a much uh, more diverse political party, attracting people who are um, African American, Latino, uh, LGBT, whatever the, uh, you know, the, the, the reason why people feel more comfortable where they are uh, taken in, where they are included as part of a political uh, movement or party. And I don't think it's politically correct to say we value that. Right. And, and I don't want to go around insulting people. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. Every immigrant is this, every African American is that, every you know, other person with you know, different religious beliefs or whatever. You know, that is, that's childish. What do you think of Cory Booker's, and you didn't comment on him, and you feel free oh, to. Oh, I, I adore you know, What do you think about him saying, kick them in the shins, essentially, start to get to that kind of political. Well, that was Eric Holder. Yeah, Eric Holder, oh, Eric Holder, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know they all look alike. No, they don't. Oh. oh, well done. You know, Hillary. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was, I, I was paid by Mark Zuckerberg to do that. <laughs> okay, um, can I just say, no, what I what Can I, I think, just say you've been reading Trump's tweets beautifully. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, thank you. No, but look, I I I think this is out of frustration um, because Trump dominates the media twenty four seven, mm -hmm. and he's brilliant at distract and divert. If if he's in a little bit of trouble over here, well, hey, look at that shiny object over there. Um, if something bad is actually happening in the world, go to a rally and get everybody all you know whipped up, uh, lock her up, and all of that. He's really very adept, um, and it's, on a, it's, it's the classic demagogue uh, toolkit. Um, so there is a frustration. It, they don't want civility, they want consent. Mm -hmm. They want you to agree with them on Kavanaugh. They want you to agree with them on immigration. They want you to agree with them. They don't want to debate, and Goodness gracious, they don't want facts, evidence, truth, or reason to be part of that debate. So I, I think it is frustrating for a lot of us, I include myself, um, when you are just pummeled by these people because they have their propaganda Fox News, they have all this other stuff out in the 
you know, ecosystem of the media, they've got the president, they've got all of this, you know, just hammering on people like me all the time. And then when somebody says, well, shouldn't you be civil? Well, I believe in it. I mean, I, I'm maybe, you know, too much. I didn't turn around and say what I said I would have said. Um, so I don't think that uh, that is any way equivalent, because we live in, unfortunately, the world of false equivalency. That is not equivalent to the relentless uh, very dangerous attacks that are waged against Democrats and others all the time. By Do you have an answer side. to lock her up? <laughs> well, I'm just waiting to be able to say lock them up. Okay. <laughs> all right, good one. Well, well played, Hillary. All right. How would you, uh, Secretary Clinton. Oh, Hillary's better. Okay, okay all right. How would you, which one do you like? I'm just curious, which one do they have to use? For? I've had Hillary a lot longer. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Has two L's, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you encourage the government to handle AI? Just a few more, and then oh. I know you have to go, because it's your birthday. Wow, we could talk about this for a long time. Well, um, go ahead, Hillary. Yeah, no. She's got the crowd. I think they don't mind hearing from yes, you. Yes, I think, uh, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do, if I had been president, was to, uh, delve deeply into what we have to do about AI. I mean, if you follow the debate between people who are you know, quite knowledgeable about technology, it, it's like split right down the middle. There are those who think it's gonna be the demise of the human race and those who think it's gonna be you know, the greatest breakthrough for the human race. Well, we need to figure out you know, which is which and are there, uh, are there plans we should make that would try to rein in uh, some of the AI before it is unloosed on the world. Now, other countries are moving very China. fast ahead, China being the, the best example. I mean, China is currently creating uh, the most intense surveillance system that's ever been created in the history of the world using facial recognition. Uh, and, AI, and AI is behind it. They're, they They are literally leading the way about how you control people, how you control their behavior certainly, but they're also moving toward track, how do you change their behavior and their thinking? So they're starting a program to give points to people where people will be rewarded by certain behaviors. Some of that will be taken from the surveillance uh, that is being done. Oh, you know, Mr. Yang over there, he did a nice thing. We're gonna tell him we're giving him some credit. Well, how do they know that? Because they've got cameras everywhere and they've got Mr. Yang's face uh, recorded. So the. The AI that I am fearful of is not just, you know, the robots that might decide to turn around and kill you one day. Um, <laughs> that does give me some pause. They but, don't care about. You know, <laughs> but you they know, don't care about. They you. don't care about that. Yeah. Right. So I, I care about the coercive control. That people have control of AI. That 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 yeah. governments will have over our lives and. Everybody should care about that. And yeah. you know, we have willingly now for more than a decade given up our most personal data that is the real guts, the bloodstream for AI. You know, our personal data is the most valuable commodity in the world right now. I mean, it's far more valuable than any energy source or any other uh, commodity you can think about. And we have given it over. We've given it over to companies by and large but that is just one little step away from governments. Yep. And some governments are already coercing or, or very nicely asking with a big fist behind the head of companies to provide that information. Uh, but then companies are, are negligent and, and irresponsible and that information is gushing out anyway. So I worry a lot about the control. You know, it really is like Brave New World, 1984, all of those allegedly science fiction um, social commentaries that uh, we read decades ago, now the tools are becoming available. And we'll watch what happens in China, uh, and I think it will scare the heck out of a lot of people in this country and Europe and elsewhere. And we're doing nothing about it. The, doing nothing one of the current, we have no CTO, we have no chief science officer. No, because they don't, I mean, you know, science is a bother. I think the guy who was doing the, yeah, I think the guy who was doing technology did a real estate for a long time. Yeah, yeah. well. That would be the pool to pool, yeah. pool, pool okay. from, right? All right, two last things. From one nasty woman to another. I don't know what nasty woman's in the audience, but I think there's a lot. <laughs> well, where, do we, where do we go from here? To the ballot box. I mean, you know, please, please. Um, 
there, there are so many important issues to talk about, and obviously we couldn't talk about them all in just uh, one of our uh, fun conversations, our third, as mm -hmm. Kara said. But everything depends upon this election, and I can't stress it too much. I mean, I know if, if young people voted at even half the percentage that people over 65 vote, this country would look very different. And I think part of the challenge is to convince every young person that elections are always about the future and it's far more about your future than it is about mine. And I think anything you can do between now and the time the polls close on November 6th, there are some really consequential congressional races here in New York, in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania, uh, places that are within easy distance that you could go and knock on doors and make phone calls or even stay at home and do the same by contacting a campaign. If we turn our vote out and we overcome the suppression efforts in uh, places like Georgia, I was just in Florida with Andrew Gillum who is a fabulous uh, candidate, absolutely great. Um, and, and, you know, he's doing everything he can to get as big a vote as possible so there can't be any question uh, that somebody could undercut him. Uh, so that's what we've got to do. And there's nothing more important than, as, than once we hopefully take back the House, maybe hold our own in the Senate, pick up some governorships, then we've got to say, okay, an agenda. And let's drive that agenda. And it needs to be, you know, as, as big a list as we can because we have to get as much done in a year as possible before the presidential campaign takes off in earnest. And, you know, to lay down the groundwork about this is what, this is what citizens, this is what voters should expect. So uh, there'll be a lot to talk about after we are uh, hopefully successful in this election. All right, last question. Is it your birthday? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is my birthday. That's my toughest one. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> Jennifer, that is so cute. Oh, my gosh. I think there's candy in there for your grandchildren. I think that's fabulous looking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can go back and tell my grandchildren I got something out of coming. Yeah. <laughs> you can bring it to them. That is so cool. Thank you. All right, Hillary Clinton, what's your current mood? My current mood? Yeah, what is it? Um, optimistic, positive, determined. You know, I mean, don't let them get you down. That's all I can tell you. Don't let all them right. get you down. Thank you. <laughs>